Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today is the death anniversary of Nusrana Professor Dr. Ibrahim. And most of you will be aware that he was a symbol of human welfare and service. And he has always said that even on his day of death, the work must not be stopped. And the National Council of Diabetic Association soon adopted that his death anniversary will be observed as the service day. Diabetic Association is, of course, dedicated to service of diabetics and other related disorders. But this will be a special day where more service will be given. And we shall take a pledge that we shall do whatever possible for the diabetics of the world, irrespective of their social, economic, religious, whatever status you can think of. And for the last 26 years, we have also been holding an oration in memory of National Professor Ibrahim. And this year, we are specially privileged and fortunate that we have a person, the name of Janet Grant, to give this oration. You can see his profile, very short profile, on the screen. I shall not go detail through it, but I would just mention of, of a very special a relationship that we have uh, with Janet. Janet and her husband, Rod, that when we started organizing uh, education for doctors through distance learning method, she is the one who came uh, and helped us to install that program without any remuneration. Uh, I requested her that, uh, Janet, we shall not be able to pay you any money, but we shall just bear your expenses. And she said, I still remember it, she said, for Bangladesh, I'm prepared to do it even without expenses being reimbursed. I'll do it. And this uh, distance learning program, I'm happy to say, Janet, that has become the largest GP training program in the world now. We have now trained more than 16,000 young practitioners in diabetes. Having said that, I thought it would be an opportune time that we invite her to give the oration and request her to speak about distance learning. But the importance of distance learning is well, well appreciated in developed countries. But it has become even more important for developing countries, especially so when people can see during COVID times. With these few words, I will just say salient points about her profile, that she is an honorary professor now in the University College London. Uh, she's a senior scholar of the Department of Medical Education, University of Illinois, Chicago, College of Medicine, and Professor Emeritus of Education in Medicine, at the UK Open University and personal advisor to the President of the World Federation of Medical Education. Uh, she has got many laurels. I will not go through it. She has got made, made many publications, wrote books on these subjects. You can see it on the list. Uh, and Professor, Professor Grant has been a regular a regulator in both medical education and legal education. And she has chaired the development of the 200, uh, 2020 WFMA standard for basic medical education and 2021 WFMA standard for distributed and distance learning. Janet, please. 
thank you so much. Uh, let me just. Um, oh, I need to. Uh, I'm there. Yeah, right. Let me just get my uh, presentation. So um, thank you so much for that. And I must thank you also for the invitation to present this oration. It's, um, it's a, a huge responsibility and it's a huge privilege to do this. Um, I don't underestimate uh, what this task involves and I hope that I will do uh, Dr. Ibrahim the justice that he deserves. Um, I'm not going to explain in detail anything about distance and distributed learning. I hope that what I will do is to give an overview and a perspective um, and to relate it to the work and the vision um, that Dr. Ibrahim set out. So thank you very much indeed for this uh, invitation. So um, today's newspapers um, have also commemorated um, Dr. Ibrahim and today they have him designated as a believer in change. Um, and I think that's true. But I think that his belief in change was based on a very, very robust set of values on his vision and on his incredible education um, and analysis. His perspective was not one that most people in his time had he was a long way ahead of his time. Many people who are a long way ahead of their time um, fail to make a mark, but he did not. He is one of the few who brought the world to him uh, as he went out to the world. So I'm really privileged to talk about this man who was a, a celebrated physician, as we know, a gifted teacher. But his organizational ability, which I have seen and I'll talk about, was something which was remarkable. We can't just achieve things by thinking. We have to achieve things by doing and by getting other people to do. And that's what he did. He was an organizer. And in all of that, a reformer, in an area which certainly needed reform. But he was so much more. <laughs> His contributions to medicine and diabetes were the contributions that you would expect a physician, a researcher, an academic to make. And we mustn't forget that. He wasn't just a social activist. He was much, much more than that. And his life of service in the government sector was something that reflected the vision and the values that he actually had. His organisational perspective caused him to found the Diabetic Association in Dakar, but at that time as well in Karachi, in Lahore. He had a vision which now people are still talking about and trying to implement in terms of patient partnerships, which when he was thinking about this, when there were hierarchies and elites that are so established, this was revolutionary thinking. He established multi-professional teams and still we are talking about how best to do that. He did it. His vision was so far ahead. And it was largely for people with diabetes. And he wanted to make sure that those people would be cared for with no limit 
to the care that they received, that this would be free of charge. But of course he was an academic and he established Burdem, the Bank Bangladesh Institute of Research and Rehabilitation, and that's important in diabetes, endocrine and metabolic dis disorders, which is still there as a wor world leading organization in research and in practice. And for me, what's important also is a postgraduate academy. But still, there are many, many countries where postgraduate training is sadly lacking. He had that vision. He knew that without postgraduate training, you would not establish the cadre of people to provide care that were actually needed. And I think that the other important thing is the vision that he had for integrated health and social care. In my country, they're still talking about how on earth can we do this? And I think many of us are in despair. He thought about this, he planned this, and he enacted this so many decades ago and thought about how these things could be sustainable as institutions and sustainable as community development. The original thinking, the analysis of all of this is really difficult to comprehend and it cannot be overestimated. So his influence was in many things and I think from what I know about him, there is no greater visionary influence on the health and well-being of people of Bangladesh. But I think also that that influence goes well beyond Bangladesh through all the people who have followed in his footsteps. So this is now something that has international recognition. And he was the catalyst for those effects that can be seen today and will be seen tomorrow, not only in Bangladesh, but all over the world. So to commemorate him on this day is something that is very, very important. But what we also know is that he is also remembered on every other day and in all the actions and activities that he has catalyzed. So I'm sitting here in London, my home, in my study, and in my home upstairs, there's a glass room and this is it. And there's a space here in this picture which is usually for the scrapbook of 1983-1984. You can see that um, Dr. Azad mentioned my husband. My husband is a great scrapbook keeper. And you can see here the space for 1983-1984. And when I wrote this talk, that scrapbook was on my desk and you can see it here. And you can see my husband's writing. And those words that you can see on that page were written in Bangladesh. So what I want to do is to read from that diary, is to read from that scrapbook that was compiled every day in Bangladesh. So on the 29th of December, 1983, what my husband wrote was, today we went to Burdem, where we met Dr. Ibrahim and were shown around. They have things marvelously organized with a good appointment system, good records and an integrated team approach with dietitians, family planners, social welfare workers, all contributing. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier, his organizational ability, his ability to establish sustainable organizations and his uh, view that it takes a team 
to deliver health care was right there. You could not fail to notice it. So that was December 1983. And then my husband writes on another day, we then went to a village area where with nutrition as the key, intervention in village life and ways had been made to encourage self-help to a better life. So Dr. Ibrahim was not there to do things to people. He was there to do things with people so that those people could become self-directing, could become self-determining and could become independent in what they were doing. And that we noticed and we didn't know that all these decades later, we would be summarizing that in this oration. And then what my husband wrote was, it was marvelously positive to see all that was underway there were new crops being grown, latrine slabs constructed, women being trained in handicrafts and free medicines and medical care were dispensed. Men were learning welding. Dr. Ibrahim's community approach, his understanding of the structure of society, of its social fabric and how that related to the illnesses that people had and to how to care for them was absolutely astounding. The breadth of his vision, which we noticed on this short visit, and I can still remember it now, was really a remarkable thing and something not to be forgotten. So it isn't just that these things are said about Dr. Ibrahim, it's that these things are done. And my, my husband went on to say the most encouraging aspect was to treat each family unit as a set of individual problems, not to try to provide blanket solutions to a blanket set of variables. The whole philosophy was to optimize the villagers' way of life, not to destroy it, to support practical interventions that would last. This is a man who valued the lives of other people and valued what those people valued in their own lives. That is really something to remark on and to <laughs> admire and to follow. So that was 1983. And these observations tell us so much that there is to know about this man. And the newspaper headings tell us this, the great reformer, but an organized reformer. He was a manager of reform. He didn't simply have a reformation vision. He knew how to put it into place. He was a believer in change, but not the sort of change that destroys the past and the present, the sort of change that values what's good and builds on it and that's because he was a great humanitarian he valued people and he valued what people value that is quite a different view from the view of many he maintained a shared vision with the people he was working with with the people in his case who very often and mainly were people living with diabetes. His sympathy towards them was really quite something to behold. So he was a scientist, a physician, who practiced whole person medicine in the ways in which today people are still trying to practice whole person medicine. And he did that before the term was invented. He was a community developer before others had learned to value the power of people as they are. And he saw people in their context, and that is the only way we can possibly succeed. And that observation is directly reflected in the programme of education and training in diabetes care that, as you've heard, is now one of the most successful programmes in the world the distance learning program in diabetology that I had the 
privilege to um, share in developing. And I'll tell you the story of that rather than talking about what distance learning actually is. But the most important thing that I do want to say about what distance learning is, that it's a democratizing force in education. And it does for education what Dr. Ibrahim was doing for the people. It enables education to come to people where they are without interrupting their daily life. And that is what he did in the care that he set up and provided. So it is actually the same philosophy. And it came as no surprise to me whatsoever that the sorts of organisations and processes that he set up would think that distance learning is a good idea because it's the same sort of thing. So it is a legacy of caring for the whole community because distance learning cares for the whole community of its learners. And here we see uh, Dr. Tofail, who we worked with right from the beginning on this uh, programme, and he's still there developing it. I'm delighted to say so this is about training and educating clinicians in the context of their own practice to offer the best care available. And you can see parallels with what Dr. Ibrahim was doing. It made the bird expertise and still does available to all. So the history of the course, um, these three people pictured here have been very, very important, a sustained way, as have many others. But uh, my dear friend, Professor Hajra Matab, Professor Azad Khan, Dr. Tofel Ahmed, now Professor Tofel Ahmed, they originally worked on this and they identified some key issues. There was a need to raise the awareness of diabetes amongst the population and in the need to ensure that there's sufficient expertise among doctors who are trained to recognize and treat diabetes in all its stages and all its places, and also to provide that education that's needed to provide that awareness. So they had that vision, which is the same Burdem, Dr. Ibrahim, Ibrahim vision but it needed to be done rapidly, um, as you will know. So distance learning was the right way to go. And this was meant to be just a little history of how I came to be here. Um, Dr. Hachal Martab, Dr. Janet Grant, as we were then, we met in 1972 in King's College Hospital Medical School. I was sitting in a room, she walked in, uh, it was an amazing day, um, and we've been friends ever since. In 1978, I moved to the Open University via the World Health Organization, and the Open University was the first, and I have to say best, distance learning university in the world. And I moved there, but I continued in medical education, and there I developed distance learning programs for healthcare professions and did that number of areas I planned we planned a distance learning medical school as well uh, which was approved by our government and by the general medical council um, and in 2001 so that was nine uh, no not nine years it was much more than nine years um, in 2001 we decided that distance learning was the answer to the issues which had been identified in Bangladesh so 30 years difference between the time that we met and the time that this happened. But all the time we were going ahead and developing the skills and the perspectives that were required. So we developed this course along with Professor Mike Stewart, who's Professor of Neuroscience from the Open University. So there was this link between the Open University and Milton Keynes in the United Kingdom and in Bangladesh. So we came along and did that. 
And we, went, we took this course through all the necessary stages of development. You can't just write one of these things because it's a very complex thing. And to succeed, you have to take it through the right stages. And we did. And that was very good because very often people want to force you to do this quickly. But we were not forced to do it quickly with you. We took everything through the right stages. We did a feasibility study. We then, almost two years later, or 18 months later, we ran workshops on how to write what were then course texts, which now have become online. We piloted the course, having trained tutors. And in March 2005 was the first end of course evaluation. We took a cautious approach that made sure that it worked. And what we have seen is that this does work. So any distance learning designer starts with a situation analysis. Where do students study? What methods and media are available to them? There are many ways of designing effective distance learning, and we designed the way that suited your context. And so we all went out together um, to look at this context. We wanted to know about places and times of study. We wanted to know about infrastructure, about the time that people have, about the resources that were available. You have to know all of these things about the context of learning, or you can develop something that sounds great to you, but won't work for the students. So we took a very serious look at all of that in our feasibility study. We reviewed what was going on in Burden that might be the basis of this course on the clinical wards and in other diabetics, diabetes centres in Dakar. We looked at television and audiovisual facilities in Dakar, which in fact we didn't need. We looked at the computer and production facilities in Dakar, which I have to say were very, very impressive. Um, and we made site visits to assess the suitability of possible regional training centres. So we went to Camilla, for example. So we had a really good look at the context. And at the same time, we were consulting, we were running meetings to, and this is my colleague on the top left there, Mike Stewart. We were running dissemin dissemination meetings because you have to obviously keep everybody interested, understanding, involved in such a huge thing. And this was done really, really well and has resulted in the success that it is. But this is also part of this inclusive philosophy that Dr. Ibrahim set up. And we cannot underestimate that. There was a climate, a set of values that led to this course. So later on, we ran a workshop to develop course text. People have to learn how to do this. And this was our production team. I hope that some of you are there watching this now and remember this. Uh, these people worked so hard. They had so much to learn about how to communicate in distance learning. And they did. They sat there and they wrote. They were absolutely amazing. So we ran course development, course writing workshops. So just to say, what is this distance learning then? Well, distance learning is a type of blended learning. It's a way of putting together different ways of learning in an organized and planned fashion. It's a deliberate combination of a variety of teaching and learning methods. Um, and we'll see in a minute that this course has that variety. Some might be technology based, some might be print based. And even these days, people still prefer to learn via print. I know it might seem old fashioned, but it's human. People like a pencil and a page they can turn. They cannot forever be looking at a computer. And there are face to face elements in distance learning as well, which means that clinical medicine can be taught at a distance because there are face to face elements. And that's why we looked at all the clinical facilities where that training could occur. 
So this stimulates learning, which is why you have to learn how to write these materials and it delivers the curriculum. It is a very disciplined thing. So that team did that. It was quite remarkable. So distance learning is the individual study of specially prepared learning materials, usually print still. Integrated learning resources and learning events, lots of other learning experiences and student support from local teachers and academic advisors and lots of feedback on learning. We don't know much about learning, but we do know that feedback makes a difference. So you have to build all that into your distance learning and all of that is there in your course, all of it. It's a very organized pathway. You have to take people through, guide them through, or they get lost. It's actually quite a controlling thing, despite everything that we say these days about self-directed learners. It is a very controlled process and a very rich learning experience. So the original course design had 10 modules in print with clear aims and instructions and timings and in-text exercises, which Mike and I edited and now on an online platform. It had local and central tutorials, clinical experience, project work, which really makes it very immediate for learners. Tutor marked assignments, which gives feedback uh, to students and students need feedback and an end of course examination and quality assurance at every stage. These are essential components, they are all there. So there was a nice timetable, topics, there were tutorials, clinical practice in a diabetic center or a teaching hospital. You can see here projects, discussions with tutors, ward rounds, all sorts of activity, all carefully blended into this distance learning course. So, we had a workshop to train those tutors because the way in which those tutors uh, behave is really, really important. They need to be encouraging. They need to be able to give constructive feedback. So we provided guidelines about their teaching style, about how and when to meet students, about the content of the meetings, about record keeping, which is also fundamental to distance learning. You've got to keep a track of everything. Um, remember, Dr. Ibrahim, as an organiser and manager, distance learning needs that. And it has assessment methods that people had to learn about as well. So this was a complex phenomenon. People learned how to do it clearly so successfully. We piloted this in five <coughs> with 50 participant doctors, that's groups of 10, with one tutor. And it was wonderful. The effort that went into developing this hugely successful course was massive. And it was done so well. And it, oh, that's upside down. That's interesting. Please read that little slide the other way up because the exam scores were excellent. That's interesting. I turned that slide around yesterday and then in between it turns itself back. However, so the scores on the exams were excellent. And then there was an end of course um, evaluation uh, and we went ourselves to a regional centre in Dinajpur. We wanted to know if the course was effective, where it was most needed. That's what you need to know. And we talked to people and we asked amongst many other things, did the course improve your ability to care for people living with diabetes? And we talked about that in detail. It wasn't just a yes, no. Uh, we wanted to understand how it worked and how it didn't work and how it needed to be changed and so on. And the answer is yes, it did. And when you develop distance learning correctly, the answer is almost always yes, it has done what it intends to do because you have looked at everything during the development phase. So yes, it did. And we know that it did. And we know that it does. And we know from all of the subsequent work that Professor Azad and all of the others have done on this, that this continues to be a huge success. So I ask myself then, where might Dr. Ibrahim's vision lead us educationally? 
He talked about community development, education, distance learning is for all. And that's what we need. And all is doctors, patients, children. Lots of different topics can be covered in this way with different audiences for improvement in healthcare, for improvement in health and well-being, for wide accessibility. And we know that distance learning is something that people with very little actual ed formal education can benefit from. We've seen that in this country where the Open University was actually set up for people in the Northeast who were unemployed, who were very poorly educated. <laughs> that was its purpose. So that vision can be extended. And the question that I'd like to ask is whether or not this distance learning can now become distributed learning. And that really is something that people are starting to think about very, very seriously. And you have the basis for it because of the way you've done it. So distributed learning has learners away from the central institution, but the central institution itself incorporates the facilities and staff near to those students to deliver the curriculum. So in a distributed system, the central institution is itself distributed. It isn't the centre going out, it is that that centre becomes a distributed, all-encompassing, locally present organisation. Learners being sort of, uh, set, uh, supported by central, but by local teaching staff who are part of the organisation. And those local teaching staff, of course, supported by a centre, but they are still part of that organisation. And a rich variety of virtual technology based and face to face teaching, learning methods and assessments. Now, your course and the way in which you've organised things is well on the way to having the identity of a distributed organisation. And that is something that really I think you could develop. <laughs> Managed, whole <laughs> <laughs> And what would you manage? Well, if you look at the WFME standards for distributed and distance learning that we've just written, you can look at the character of distributed and distance learning, course design, course production, assessment, student support, academic and clinical staff and their support, course management, which is the key to everything, and quality assurance. So the programme that you have there is already a world leading example of distance learning in medicine. It could develop into a complete model of distributed learning that supports healthcare professionals and patients by bringing the whole educational institution to them. And that would include everything that that institution does. It could be, and I have every belief that you can do this, the first institution to demonstrate that it meets the WFME standards for distributed and distance learning. You are more than halfway there. You really could do this. And it would be a wonderful, wonderful example to the world. And it follows on from everything that we have said about Dr. Ibrahim's um, community orientation. He was himself uh, a person with a distributed vision. So to end, I think that distributed and distance learning is the legacy of caring for the whole community that he set up. The model of distance learning that's based on learning in the context of practice came from and is in concordance with Dr. Ibrahim's values and vision of caring for all and educating all where they are to the highest possible standards. It has begun. I hope and I'm sure that it will not stop. And as was said today in the newspaper, this great reformer, this believer in change, this great humanitarian has a legacy not only in medical care, in social development, in societal building, but also in the education that supports all of that. 
Thank you. Dear viewers and audience, you will agree that it's a marvelous oration, very, very practical in today's world. Janet, I don't have enough words to thank you, but I can tell you we will keep in contact and follow up with your vision. You know, uh, I, I have already informed it is uh, practice that the orator is given a gold, uh, gold medal and a certificate. And because of the COVID situation, we can't hand it, or hand it to you right now, but it will be handed to you in due time to your place. Uh, it is, uh, uh, the, the way it is, the orator is not directly questioned during the meeting, but uh, anybody, because there's a large audience here that uh, Janet could not see. Uh, I hope that you wouldn't mind, I'll give your email to them. If they have any query, if they have to pursue further, you will not, uh, you will not disappoint them. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's fine. Thank you very much. With these few words, I'd like to thank you again and thank all the, all the viewers and uh, uh, people who have, part who have uh, uh, participated in this oration. Thank you. Thank you so much.